Welcome to coverage of Grand Prix Minneapolis. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Jacob Van Lunen, and it is time for the final. Steve Locke came in in the first seed after going undefeated in the Swiss. He did take a draw or two down the stretch to get into the top eight, but he has yet to have an actual loss on his record. Corey Baumeister finds himself in the finals of yet another Grand Prix, looking to book his second GP trophy of the calendar year. An impressive feat, to be sure. Mono black zombies for Steve and black green constrictor for Corey. Uh, Jake, can you break down a little bit about how this matchup goes as we see these first few turns uh, play out? So Steve is trying to be as aggressive as possible while breaking up the creature combos that exist in Corey's deck. If Corey's able to have winding constrictor and untap, his deck can do really powerful things that Steve's deck isn't capable of keeping up with. However, if Steve is able to keep Corey's board empty while continuing to apply pressure, then Steve is going to be in a real pos good position to just steal the game away early on. This could be a quick one, Jake. Yeah, once they get to the later stages of the game, Steve needs to go wide and Corey needs to go big. Check this out, though. Dreadwanderer into Dreadwanderer into Dark Salvation. Kill your Winding Constrictor, and Corey's left scrambling here at 14 life. He's going to try to stabilize behind a Catacomb Sifter here on turn three which is a pretty nice stabilization it tool in this good. spot. I mean, it can trade with one of those Dread Wanderers while also gobbling up something with a Catacomb Sifter. And that, if Steve doesn't have a removal spell, specifically Grasp of Darkness here, the brakes might be on already. Nothing. He's just going to pass the turn back after having played that Relentless Dead. So a breath of air here for Corey Baumeister. Under the gun quickly, but now some breathing room. Yeah, and this is what we've seen Catacomb Sifter do all weekend. You know, it really just establishes uh, a sense of parity in the game, where it feels like a player is getting run over, and then on turn three they cast Catacomb Sifter, and suddenly they're able to start working their way back into the game. Also, Dark Salvation, the card we talked about, if you have it on a particular turn. It's very strong, and here we saw Steve having it when he had two zombies in play right after Corey had played that Constrictor, and just brutal. Speak of Catacomb Sifter, another How about copy. Double Trouble, yeah, two of them. And something that's also worthwhile to note about Catacomb Sifter is the other text on it, which is that whenever another creature you control dies, you scry one, becomes very powerful in a deck like Corey's, where he's trying to assemble specific creature combinations. Wow. Steve Locke. Two copies of Liliana's Mastery in hand, if I'm seeing this right. Wow. Oh, boy. And we talked earlier about how Corey's the one trying to go big. There's one of them. Oof. If he gets to cast these on back-to-back -back turns, how in the world is Corey supposed to mess with that? It's going to be really tough. It is worthwhile to note, though, that Corey could conceivably make some sort of play of Winding Constrictor into Virtuous Gear Hulk using these Scions, but even that is going to keep him on the defensive. And while he will have good blocks, it might not be enough, because Steve's getting in for a lot of damage right now, even. Steve kind of lined up a huge attack, though. He's now reconsidering. I think what's going on is I do believe he has another copy of Liliana's Mastery, and he may be saying, if I attack here and lose, like, two, 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 to these, two or three of these creatures, how much better will it be for me next turn if they all get plus one, plus one again? Like, maybe I can just overpower, yeah, and just give Corey no good blocks ever. Yeah, and, you know, Steve has been taking the conservative route more often than not this tournament, and it's been working out really well for him. Yeah, he has been smashing this tournament. Corey has his back against the wall, and he doesn't even know that Steve has another copy of Liliana's Mastery in hand. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what I saw, Jake. And if so, oh my goodness. Yeah, that's going to be the final nail in the coffin, if you will. Indeed. It's my pleasure to announce we are 
Such a strong card, even by itself. And then you take into consideration the fact that you're playing other zombies, and you know, this is the type of anthem that I can get behind. <laughs> Corey knows that this is a really important turn. He also probably is asking himself, why no attack last turn? Like, it wasn't a disaster if Steve attacks there. It just perhaps wasn't super great. Ooh, here we go. How about a whiny constrictor? What else do you have, Corey? He needs something else, but that's, that's a good start to a recipe. <laughs> you know, it's the olive oil, if you will. You know it's going to be good when it's done. I guess Corey does not know how much power is going to be coming across the table at him in the following no, turn. But he's starting to figure it out, I think. He's going to play a Rishkar Pima Renegade here and spout off four tokens, but this is risky business. Wow, he really can't make up his mind here, can he? This is a tough spot it, I mean, for Corey. I mean, this is hard. Yeah. Really tough spot for Corey. He's going to get a, a pair of scries here. I also think that he will have really put some thought into why Steve's not attacking and maybe even have figured out, well, there could be something pretty bad coming. Corey's doing a little scrying. Yeah, he's got to decide what order he wants to put these chip two cards in. He put one on the bottom. I believe one on the top. There's Rishkar. And, you know, he's going to get to make two guys into four fives, which will match up reasonably well against the zombies, even once there are a pair of Liliana's Masteries in play. The problem is that there are so many zombies attacking that even with those two good blockers, he's going to have to come up with bad blocks right. for the other 16 points of power that are coming across the table at him. And I think you're right. I think that is another copy of Liliana's Mastery. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if there's really a better thing somebody could do in this slot. No, I mean, back-to-back -back turns, casting it when he already had a fairly well-built-out board, that's just, that's just rude. Do it, Steve. Dark Salvation could also be very good if he has that as an option. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. No, it looks like he drew Grasp. Hmm. Grasp of Darkness. So he's deciding, what do my attacks look like? If I can kill one of these creatures first, or maybe... Attack with everything, let you block with your two catacomb sifters, then grasp one down. Then I can save my creature, kill yours, only lose one. But no. It's Liliana's mastery number two. All the zombies are getting plus two, plus two now. Yeah, now that, that card adds eight points of power to the board while also giving all of his other creatures what? <laughs> plus one, plus one. You know, it's just brutal. And even the, uh, the patient and plotting Steve Locke has said, Ship them. Everybody in yeah. the red zone, you figure out the blocks. Like you said uh, a minute ago, Jake, Corey does have two good blocks, right? He's got yeah. the, the two catacomb sifters, but the rest, well, it falls off a little after that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now he's, he's got to do at least one chump just to survive here. And so he's going to get a, a double block here on the Relentless Dead, and then he's going to chump here. And one thing that's nice for Corey is that, you know, he's, he's going to get to scry a bit. He can draw whatever he needs in the following turn. But it's hard to come up with anything for the following turn that allows Corey to win this game. And you see that look on his face there. He knows this is a really bad position that he's found himself in. And the type of deck he's playing is not the one that's built to come back from this, right? I, You know... Yeah, this is sweepers. He's supposed to be ahead mm. at this stage of the game. I think turn four or five is where his deck turns the corner, so to speak. Right. And, and you can see how well this attack worked out for Steve. Look at his board still. Yeah, Corey, you know, Corey got three four fours off the table there. 
Mm-hmm. It's turn five, and there's still 20 points of power coming at him on the following turn. That's if Steve doesn't add anything to his board. Right. And remember, we know that Steve also has a Grasp of Darkness in hand, too, which could very easily clear the way for the victory here, depending on what Corey's got for this turn. Yeah, and I mean, Corey may be trying to think about, you know, ways that he can survive, considering what's just on the board now, not even taking into consideration the Grasp of Darkness that's in Steve's hand. Corey's resolving some uh, scries there from the Catacomb Shifters. Ooh. Ooh. If he's leaving a card on top, that means he's, he's probably got at least one more turn not taking into account the Grasp of Darkness. Yeah, he just left a land up for that Vergerous Gear Hulk, Jake. So how close is this here? If he casts it, he's got four blockers against five attackers. He's at six. This actually works out well for him from this position. Mm-hmm. He can make enough blockers so that Steve can't really get him. The main key here is if Corey can keep all of his creatures out of Grasp of Darkness range, which he does here. Yeah. Very smart from Corey Baumeister. Corey with a beautiful understanding of the matchup. You know, really playing smart. the math game perfectly here. Playing as a whole bunch of 4-4s. Four what do you want? You want 4-5s and 5-5s. Five five and Corey could fall to 2 here, but if he does... Steve's board looks pretty bad. Yeah. And, I mean, there are any number of cards in Corey's deck that could even allow Corey to swing back for the win, even with that Grasp of Darkness in Steve's hand, which is just absurd to me that we're even in this situation right now. <laughs> wow. Back-to-back -back Liliana's Masteries. Corey still not necessarily dead, depending on what Steve drew, of course. You know, his hand is he's actually going to go for Scavenger Grounds here. And that's actually going to give him Revolt here, Jake. How do you like that? I think that's a beautiful play because it wins the game How for him. How sweet is that? Yeah. Wow, that is smart. Really nice play from Steve Locke. And yeah. now he crashes in for wow. the win. What a creative way to get Revolt going. Normally you think of Maybe sacrificing a creature, or maybe yeah. an evolving what? Right there, very nice scavenger grounds, yeah. activated. Down the line. Yeah, and you know he did have to draw there though because the card he had in his hand when he went to his draw step would not get the job done as it said. That was grasp of darkness. He needed yeah. that fatal push, and to see the line. Really smart stuff from both players, but Steve Locke ends up edging out Corey Baumeister in game number one, and boy, that was close. That was beautifully played on was, both parts. That was really fun to watch. Yeah, that was one of the better games I've ever seen in a Grand Prix final, to be honest. Look at you. No, I mean, both players drew very well. Both players played near perfectly. It was great to watch. Really fun. I and feel like if, if both players had their hands revealed for the entirety of the game, they would have played the exact same way. Which is about the <laughs> biggest compliment you can give. Absolutely. So if we look at these sideboards here, something that's really interesting is, you know, we've talked about it in the past, but Corey, in post-boarded games when he plays against these zombie decks, he has the Henny's expertise, which is great in this matchup. Uh, easily the most important card here. Only two copies, but if he's able to draw one of them, the matchup sways wildly into his favor. And... He is able to scry quite a bit with his Catacomb Sifters, and that's going to help him find those particular cards. Another card that's going to be really good for Corey here is Sky Sovereign, console flagship. We've seen Repeatable that card. Repeatable way to kill zombies. The other thing is that it flies. Mm. And zombies doesn't really have a good way to deal with no, flyers. No, they really don't, do they? And zombies also does not have any sort of instant speed way to deal with a five no. toughness five casting cost flyer. Right, not at all. So something that Corey can do is he can put a whole bunch of plus plus one counters on that Sky Sovereign and just kill Steve. And Steve really can't say much about it. So these post-boarded games get very interesting. I'm excited to see what happens. Uh, from the other angle, Steve, 
his sideboard options, not the worst. He gets an extra grasp, which is really important here for breaking up the creature combos, and he gets two copies of Never Return. Uh, he has a Sky Sovereign of his own also, by the way, which will likely come in. It's yeah. not quite as strong because a lot of the time the creatures on Corey's side of the board get it out of range a little bit quicker. Um, the one thing Sky Sovereign has going for it for Steve, however, is that Corey's playing Nyssa. And Sky Sovereign's ability to kill a Planeswalker right. through any number of blockers of is very strong. Yeah, that makes Especially sense. a Planeswalker that has as few loyalty as Nyssa. Yeah, Corey may even be incentivized to use Nissa's loyalty very liberally. Yes. Minus, you know, get, like get it right get, away. Make hay while the sun's shining, as they say. <laughs> wow. So, Steve Locke on absolute terror this weekend. Yeah, he hasn't lost. Just skip that part of the GP experience. <laughs> <laughs> this is Corey's local GP, by the way. For Corey? Yeah, he's from North Dakota, and this is the closest a major Magic tournament comes to where he lives. So he drove three hours here. I see. So that's how you determine if it's local or not. <laughs> three hours. You when, you, three hours? when you live in North Dakota, three hours is local, apparently. I think you're that's right. how he described I, I it to me. I think that's exactly how the math yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is where Brad's from. A little stretching in. Loosen up a bit. Steve Locke now, having not lost a match the entire weekend. He drew two matches, but he hasn't lost one. Here in the finals, one game away from continuing the streak and taking home the title. Corey, back against the wall, needs to win two in a row here. He does get the advantage of that sideboard, though, in, this, in these post-boarded games. It's not a bad matchup for him. But, yeah, being down a game's tough. You know, that, that mm -hmm. skews the percentages pretty strongly in Steve Locke's favor. To be fair, I think Steve Locke is a slight favorite in game one. And the fact that he was on the play means that he's an even greater favorite. Okay. I think that in game two... Uh, Corey might become a slight, slight favorite. But I think if he's on the draw, it might even still be in Steve's favor a bit. Though an incredibly close match, and play will be a major factor here. The power and toughness numbers and the way these players are able to line those up against each other will be of utmost importance in deciding who's able to win this match. Corey's all business now. Look at him. Yeah, serious mode has been turned on. Oh, yeah. There's a lot on the line here. $10,000 for first place. Mm -hmm. Also, and very uh, valuable pro points for right. him. I was going to say that, uh, you know, this is actually the first premier level event of the next season. The, the yep. Pro Tour last weekend wrapped the prior season. So this is a really strong start for Corey. Honestly, regardless, right? Like, just yeah. if we just stop right here, he's in good shape. But, but winning a GP, getting eight points, and one of your slots maxed out, Right off the bat, season is such a boon. Yeah. Really, it's that's the kind of thing that makes you go, "We're doing it." Yeah, you dig know? your heel into first place, yes. and anybody who tries to come up to the top of the mountain, you just push them right down. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how you do it, to be honest. <laughs> All right, Corey gets to be on the play for this game. He's kept. Let's see if Steve keeps too. No, he's not going to be able to keep. Okay. So the percentages bump ever so slightly over in Corey Baumeister's <laughs> favor <laughs> once again. <laughs> this has been a great tournament. We've had a really good time hanging out with you. Thank you for joining us and uh, and also exploring this new standard format. It's pretty wide open right now. This is. You know, Jake, I thought you were 100% correct when you talked about it earlier when you said, you know, this is the time when it's fun. This is my favorite part of a constructed magic format when it is just crazy out there. And these are the two decks in the finals. These are both established decks, but you can really play whatever you want to play to great success in this format. I mean, this is not what anybody expected to see here in the finals. 
Apparently, somebody brought food. <laughs> Corey's going for a little energy snack there. Again, the percentages just keep tipping in his favor. Trail mix? Are you kidding? All right, let's see what Steve's got as far as his six-card opener. Does he have a keep? He's got a one-lander, Jake, but, of course, he also has that scry, and he's on the draw this time. No. Discipline mulligan there from Steve Locke, but that's bad news. If he's yeah. going to stay undefeated here and take down this GP, he's going to have to do it with a five-card hand this game. Otherwise, he'll have another game to try. Yeah, there's still a game three here to be played. But that's assuming Corey wins this game. Yeah, which Steve is Steve could definitely win on five cards. Certainly not a foregone conclusion. Though I got to say, the smile's back. <laughs> you know, when your opponent moles to five, it's like, hey, I got trail mix. Yeah. You're on five. What could be worse? Or when Steve drew his opening seven, Corey's face was... Stone cold. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> now he's on five. You're right. He ate a little bit. He feels good about it. So let's see. Are we going to get a keepable five? Another one lander. This time, an if near deadlands. He's got to keep this, though. Uh, probably. Looking for a land, not finding one, passing the turn. Now, the real question here, okay, well, he found a one drop, so that's a start. It's something. Dreadwander. And you know what? He actually already had one in his hand additional to that, so he is going to get to make a play this turn and next no matter what. But how quickly can Corey get off to a quick start here? Sylvan Advocate's a nice one. Looks really good. Ooh, another land, though, for Steve. Unfortunately, it only makes colorless mana. He's just going to have to cast another Dreadwander and pass it. That means he's taking two here. And even though this is a single-color deck, those colorless lands do hurt Steve. The zombie cards are very mana-intensive for black mana. Like he's playing Grasp of Darkness. He's playing Relentless Dead. Those all require double black. That's right. And on speaking of getting hurt by your lands, you know that If Near Dead Lands has done two to Steve as well. It's his only black mana source, and it does do a damage to you when you, can't, when you tap it for black. So... This is kind of all playing into Corey Baumeister's plan. And I'll tell you what here, Jake, this is the scariest turn for Steve because he's going to do whatever he's going to do. But, ooh, Swamp off the top. It's a good one. And he's got wow. Dark Salvation. Look at this. It's going to force Corey to chump block here. And that's still going to put Nissa down to two. Corey was, you know, in a position where he could untap, play Constrictor, play a creature minus yeah. Nissa, and just be like, that's it. Now, all of a sudden, he's left with no board state outside of Nyssa, and he's facing six power. And these are the types of five-card hands we dream about. This is a dreamy one. Oath of Nyssa to kick off the turn for Baumeister. Well, he's better find something good. Some great discipline here from Steve. Recognizing, okay, I cannot win with this seven. I cannot win with this six. I'm willing to go to five cards. I'm not going to gamble with a one-lander on six cards in this GP. Wow, he did have the Whining Constrictor, too. But in this case, it's just a plant token. Was that a never in hand for Steve Locke as well? I believe so. It's a never to return. Whoa. Look at this. Kill your Whining Constrictor. Kill Nyssa. Wow. And now Corey's struggling to stay in the game. Steve Locke on a mulligan to five is way ahead on board now. Corey has plenty of time here, though, to redeploy some blockers or threats and try to get this thing back on track. But uh, this opening draw here from Steve Locke has been very impressive. At Dark Salvation, really just putting him way ahead. In both games one and two, Steve was able to cast the Dark Salvation on the third turn of the game, making a zombie and also killing one of Corey's creatures. And let's just say it's it's been really, really important to his game plan both times. Man, Corey has to settle for another copy of Nissa bringing the power 
on his side of the battlefield up to, that's right, still zero. Yeah. Pretty bad. Is Steve going to keep continue just to pressure Nissa here? It seems like that would be the play. I imagine. Corey, even with a double chump here, his Nissa just goes down to two loyalty. Mm -hmm. And then he's not in the best situation. Block, block. Nissa falls down to two, and he really needs some action here. Yeah, Corey needs to be setting up for a Verger's Gear Hulk uh, with that plant token. Otherwise, it's, it's not looking good for him at all. And it really is Steve Locke's weekend if he can take down this one in two games, including a mulligan to five on the draw. Yeah. Well, to be honest, when I mulligan to five, sometimes I'd rather be on the draw. Yeah, I know, but it's a zombie's <laughs> death. Like, yeah, yeah. Look what he's doing. He decides to play Relentless Dead rather than Flashback Return, or I should say Aftermath Return. And what's really crazy here is that if Steve draws a land in the following turn, he follows up with Liliana's Mastery. Yes, I saw that. Think about this Mulligan of Five. This is a beaut right here. Ooh. I mean, he needed some help off the top of his library. Remember, it was a one lander, and he scribed to the bottom. But boy, has he got that help. There is a fatal push, though, for Corey. And Corey just trying to use his mana efficiently at this point. Okay, well, we got big hitters on the other side of the battlefield, too, because that's Plant Token and Vergerous Gear Hulk now. So Corey's going to put good. either two or three counters on the plant and the rest on the Hulk. And he'll have nice blockers. Yeah. I like this split a lot here from Corey. It may leave his one plant susceptible to uh, Grasp of Darkness, but uh, it keeps the Vergerous Gear Hulk out of that range. It also uh, puts him in a situation where neither Grasp or Fatal Push can deal with the Verger's Gear Hulk. The other thing it does is it protects Nyssa for the following turn. So Steve trying to find the correct line here. What did he draw? Oh. Didn't need to draw anything. He's got return. He's going to use that. that. Seems reasonable. To get a zombie and then just pass the turn back. Another thing to remember here, Jake, is that... Uh, Nissa has been has done a very good job of distracting the zombies from Corey Baumeister's life total. So as much That's as this has true. been a good five here, he's at twenty. Yeah. And that's something we need to remember is that Corey's going to be ahead on cards in the long term of this game, even with Steve picking up those two for ones. Wow. Now we're going to see that Nissa minus. Yeah, now this is a really nice play from Corey here. He's activating the land before using that Nissa minus. Gets to put a plus one, plus one counter on the land. And then he wants to close the window as fast as possible. Close the window. He wants to slam the door, JVL. Yeah. <laughs> he wants to put his foot in it, put a door stop, double bolt it, and get this thing done before Steve can find another way out of it. Yeah. He Last game, he saw the inevitability of double Liliana's mastery. He does not want to no. be facing up against that again. Here we see Sylvan Advocate at full power level. It has the plus plus one counter from Nissa, Voice of Zendikar. It also has the bonus plus two plus two from Corey having six lands in play. It's also giving plus two plus two to Corey's attacking land, which is already a three three. So that makes that into a five five. So a five five death touch hissing quagmire. And this is a lethal attack, so Steve's going to be forced to throw away some of his army here. Good start from Steve, but it does look like Corey may be cleaning up the mess here and working his way towards a victory in game number two. It's not over yet, but Corey, Corey's in a good spot.
Wow. Steve's blocks, no matter how he cuts it, they're just not great. No, they're really not. This has him, what, taking nine? This is trampling over for two. So 10-11. So it's four, five, nine. So 11, yeah. Yeah. Steve down to four here. Wow, even after blocking? <laughs> yeah. My goodness sakes. No land off the top for Steve Lock. He instead found... Colossus, and I think we're going to see Corey Baumeister even things up, able to capitalize on that mulligan to five from Steve, even though Steve put up a really nice fight there. It's hard to imagine he gets out of this. I don't really know what he's supposed to do here at just four life. Nothing. And that's going to be game number two going to Corey Baumeister, trying to become a two-time GP champ here. Steve Locke. Gives up a game there. Ooh, baby. This is a close one. It all comes down to this. Got to see. The end. Steve Mulder fired Prix. that game and still kind of put a, put a good showing on. Like, what, what if he keeps seven? And being on the play also with Dark Salvation, if he's able to do that, he's able to go one drop, two drop, or one drop, one drop, Dark Salvation, puts Corey in a really bad situation. It's also important to note, though, that. Steve has had that one drop on turn one in all of these games, and that makes a huge difference in this matchup because those Dark Salvations that have been blowouts on turn three both times are not possible without one drop into Dark Salvation. Mm. And, you know, the statistical probability of that happening is not 50%. <laughs> <laughs> it is significantly below that. Well, one game left, Jake. Who do you think is going to win? Oh, man. You can have Steve Locke, the untouchable man pick. on the play with zombies. Or you can take the already GP champion, Corey Baumeister, on the draw with red green. Uh, excuse me, with uh, green black. I don't know. I think this is incredibly even. I think it'll be a well-earned Grand Prix victory for whoever ends up winning. Really? You're running, you're, you're running really the both do. teams played hard on me here? I am running the both teams played hard. I don't think I could root. <laughs> the problem is, is that as much as I want to root for both people, I don't think I have it in me to root against either of them after watching them play this weekend. These two have been playing better than anybody else I've watched this weekend. And here they are in the finals, and that makes me feel so good to know that the two people who have played the best magic I've seen this weekend are the last two people standing. A little bit of justice for you? Yeah, a lot of justice for me. All right. And here it is going to game three. All right, I won't put you on the spot then. <laughs> what does chat say? Who's going to win, chat? Is it going to be Steve Locke or is it going to be Corey Baumeister? Chat seems to be more interested in which deck wins. But. <laughs> All right, which, which one's going to win, chat? Zombies or Constrictor? Z -z zombies, Corey, Corey, Green, Black, Zombies, Zombies. Seems pretty evenly split. We've got a, we've got an excellent match on our hands. This is this one says Marshall Sutcliffe wins my heart always. All right. Well, oh well, I'll, that's, that's, that that seems reasonable. That seems right. <laughs> Nobody's arguing with that one. My beard wins. Okay. Zombies on the play. Goblins, get out of here. Marshall wins. So I got a lot of votes in here. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't even in there. Now, on the play, it's, again, important to note that Steve has the ability to completely run over the game if he's able to back up an aggressive clock with good removal. And in game one, we saw that happen. And, you know, Corey found a way to stay in that game that I don't think... 95% of Magic players would have found. You know, Corey, the way he piloted through game one to give himself a chance at victory was something really special. And it ended up not working out, and Steve had to find a really interesting line to get by that. Steve also played that game just about He also about had perfectly. to draw that removal spell. Remember, yeah. that the, the one he had did not get him out of it.
it's important to know that Corey has been also timing his explosivity with this deck. You know, we've watched him time and time again. The, the actual combos with creatures that he's able to assemble here, he is saving those combos in his hand. He's playing the Sylvan Advocates in the early turns. He's not going for the, I hope my opponent doesn't have it, here's the Winding Constrictor on turn two, let's go. He's, you know, setting up these turns with Nyssa. He's biding his time. And then he's making gigantic monsters, and he's swinging for huge amounts, and he's turning the game around on Steve and putting Steve on the back foot all at once. Well, one more game's going to decide this thing, and this is the one. Let's hope no mulligans this time. I'd, I'd like a nice... Nice clean match. Yeah, a nice clean match. Like game one. Exactly. Is that a five lander for Steve? Interesting one. I think his only threat, though, is Diagraph Colossus. And if there's any indication of the way these games have played out, that's not necessarily a winning recipe here. Yeah. He's going to mulligan. Yeah. I read, read his lips there. Corey, what do you have? Looks like Corey might be on the mulligan, too, here. Yeah, would only be fair. So Corey shuffles through those cards very quickly. Corey also going down to six. Just a one lander for Corey, and uh, he's going to send that one right on back. Still a fair fight. Yeah, you know, I, d I, I asked for no <laughs> mulligans, but if they're both going to mulligan, I can accept. Yeah. I'd prefer they both mulligan to six than both them mulliganing to five, though. Agree. <laughs> when things start going down to five, we have, uh, you know, not, not as fun magic to watch. The other thing is it's important to note here that mulligans favor Steve here. If both players are going to have six, that's better for Steve. Because Why is that? Corey's cards are better alongside other cards in his deck. Corey is, you know, working around a lot of synergy. And while it's true for Steve, too, Steve's deck has redundancy. And that's how his deck has kind of the consistency that it has mm. and the synergy that it has is through redundancy. A lot of his cards do exactly the same thing. Where Corey's cards all do very different things that interact well together. So if Corey has less cards to work with, he's going to be able to, you know, put forth less of those powerful interactions. Where Steve... Whichever cards end up in his hand, those cards do very similar things. It's like Steve's kept. They've both kept. All right, we are underway yeah. here. Both of them on six. Is it going to be Steve Locke never having picked up a loss? 13-0 and 2 in Swiss. 2-0 and in the top eight so far. And can he add a GP trophy to that? Or Corey Baumeister who already won a GP this year. Looking to add another one. Both of them putting it on top. Here we go. Crip Breaker kicks We're things off. off for Steve Locke. What does Corey have? Wow, he's already got Fatal Push at the ready just to snap off that Crip Breaker. No shenanigans for you, Steve. It looks like Steve has more pressure, though. Corey put a Grasp of Darkness back on top of the library with his scry, so we know he's got his land situation sorted. Somewhat. And we've seen Dreadwanderer be great for Steve all weekend. Gosh, it certainly has. And he always seems to have them in the early part of the game, too. And he's not drawing them on turn five or six. Mm -mm. One or two only. Relentless dead there from Steve. Passes the turn back to Corey, draws his card. Steve's tapped out. Steve misses land drop. Corey did not. That definitely bodes well for Corey, but you know, if Corey has a removal spell here, he probably wants to use it on that Relentless Dead before Steve's going to gain any sort of advantage off of it. At the same time, you know, if Corey, if Steve starts using his mana when he's this starved on mana to return that Relentless Dead back to his hand, that might be good for Corey and give Corey the tempo that he needs to steal this game away. So Yeah, I mean, I think if I'm Corey, I just assume that Steve is unlikely to have the mana to do so and so that yeah. it's probably not a huge issue. Now, if this turn is Grasp, well, then you certainly do it now. Yes. 
And that's exactly what Corey does. So Relentless Dead hits the bin, but once again, the Dread Runner gets to keep hitting. It's going to drop Corey down to 16 before Steve, oh no, misses his third land drop again and passes the turn. Here's Oath of Nyssa, but Corey really needs some action or maybe just a forest. Let's see what he gets. Yeah, so something that's interesting here is that Corey has, yeah, Corey has at least a Winding Constrictor in his hand, and he hasn't been playing it. And Steve has a few different removal spells in his hand. No land drop there from Corey either, so he's just going to play a wow. Walking Ballista for one. And there's a land off the top for Steve Locke. He found an If Near Dead lands. You have to remember both these players on the mulligan. Corey, looking at the top three cards of his library with Oath and Nissa, still unable to find the land. Yeah, he ended up just taking in this, I believe. Dread Wanderer is going to hit the red zone, is going to knock Corey down to 14. So the Walking Bliss is just going to hang for now. That can really wreak havoc with Steve's board potentially, though. He'll have to respect it. Something interesting, Corey revealed that Nyssa off the Oath of Nyssa. And uh, interestingly enough, he doesn't have double green to cast the Nyssa, but thanks to the Oath of Nyssa, he'll be able to do so. Oath of Nyssa allowing you to use any color of mana to cast your Planeswalker spells. So Steve's going to st set up for next turn rather than going too crazy here. He's going to play a Diagraph Colossus as a 4-4 four four and then try to just spout out a bunch of zombies next turn. 4-4 wow. four is quite good here, though. Yeah, and Corey in an awkward situation. The Diagraph Colossus matches up really well against what's in his hand right now. He already used that Grasp of Darkness on Relentless Dead, and... There's Nyssa. plant. Yeah. That was Liliana's mastery off the top of the library, though. He's a bit far off of that at only three lands still. Yeah, he's going to need to draw another two lands before he's able to do that. But the thing is, I think Steve has another copy of Diagraph Colossus in hand. And we know Corey doesn't have an answer to the first one, which means that Corey will not have an answer to the second one either. And if Steve attacks here with both toward the Nyssa, Corey is likely to block the Diagraph Colossus with his Walking Ballista, kill the Jackal, and then Steve will be able to cast another Diagraph Colossus, this time with three counters on it, while also netting him a zombie token. Oh, boy. Now it looks like Corey's just going to throw the plant away here. Hmm. I like this. Yeah, take two. So this is going to drop down to two loyalty. Is he just going to play another Colossus? Because, I mean, hey, that's pretty good too, right? Yeah. Just another 4-4. Four, four. And, of course, he gets a zombie from the original one. And now if he starts casting zombies, the thing gets out of control. Like, See, Corey's got his hands full here. But I really like this from Corey because this sets Corey up for the possibility. If Corey finds a land and has Yehenny's expertise, then he can minus his Nyssa, have enough counters on this Walking Ballista to finish off both of those Colossuses while completely wiping the board, and then he can play a three drop and be ahead on the board from this board state. Well, let's see if he's got it because he did find the land, Jake. I, he has yet to play Yehenny's expertise, though. Would be fantastic here. No, he's only going to play a two-mana spell. What is it, a snake, maybe? Maybe it's a Winding Constrictor? Could be. It wouldn't be the worst. It is what this deck is named after. Wow, this is... I'm, I'm actually, honest to God, biting my nails. <laughs> there we go. Couple of plus and plus one counters, both creatures. And this walking ballista. Let's look at Corey. Yeah, he's not like, hold, feeling good. Hold. With both those diagraph classes out, he has to feel awful, right? I mean, he needs to find an expertise. That's his way out of this game, out of this situation. Like, nothing else will do it for him. 
Steve stumbling a bit here with his mana. But it looks like he's got options in hand and is surveying the scene as we speak. And the thing about Diagraph Colossus is when you have two of them in play, every time he's casting another zombie, he's getting two more zombie tokens. Uh, this could be the... Super wide, super fast. I mean, this is where Corey is just like, please, 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 don't just overload the board. Unless, of course, he has that Yohannes expertise. In which case, he's like, please, 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 oh, overload yes, the board. Just lay them all <laughs> before me. No. It looks like it's going to be a fatal push targeting the snake, the whiny constrictor. Corey's thinking about something. In the meantime, snake down. Corey's left with just the walking ballista here. Yeah, but that walking ballista, not much of a defensive force when he's faced off. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Oh, here's Dark Salvation. Steve Locke moving closer and closer to an undefeated weekend here in Minneapolis. I think that may be the card that ends this Grand Prix. That could be the one that shuts the door on Corey Baumeister picking up that second trophy. And the thing is, is Yaddy's expertise is no longer good enough to get Corey back into this game. He had that window. He had those two turns where he could have drawn that card. He was unable to. Now he's taking eight. Yeah. And he's facing down lethal damage. Steve Locke, 13-0-2 in Swiss, 2-0 here in the top eight. Nobody's been able to beat him all weekend, and he is moving very close to sealing the deal against Corey Baumeister. There's Multiple Nissa. five drops stranded in Corey's hand right now. And Corey's best play here is to play Nissa, make a plant, and pass. Precarious to say the least. Though no removal spell in hand for Steve means that Corey does get to live another turn. Yeah. Corey will live to see another day, though. He's going to go down to two. So if Steve is able to advance his board. Which he is. Which he is with another creature. Yeah. Then even if Corey has a big play like a Vergerous Gearhulk on the following turn, it's not good enough. How do you like that for advancing your board? Yeah, and that's the thing about Just any pay, zombie when you, you know, double Diagraph Colossus. Yeah, two mana, six power. Corey Baumeister draws his card for the turn. Is there anything he can do? Doesn't look like it. He's looking. He's trying to find it, but Steve Locke. The man of the weekend. Untouchable match this all weekend. weekend. Incredible. Has put out 4, 8, 10, 14 power against just two life, and he's done it. Steve Locke undefeated on the weekend. Corey's going to have to settle for a second-place finish here. Mono black zombies in the hands of Steve Locke. You're looking at our champion. Great stuff. Some of his some of his friends just found out that he won. And hey, we even get a smile out of Steve. Yeah.